Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 89. Oh, thank God. <laughs> You really have a problem I've, with the I've, 80s. I've hated the 80s. I don't know why they've dragged. But did you not like the original 80s? I, I don't remember it. I was very small. I was very small. I'm, well, not, I'm, not, I'm not as old as you. Uh, yeah, so. not cripplingly old. <laughs> yeah, crazy time, the 80s. So I don't remember. We're the cusp of the 90s. I don't know why they've bothered me so much. You've been struggling of late. I have. You've been tired and grouchy. Tired and grumpy. <laughs> it's just me. Good. <laughs> Apart from that, how are you, Nick? Uh, tired and grumpy. But apart from that, it's fine. Yay! Oh, you're in good form today. You've got a, you've got a hint of the madness about hint you. Of the, hint, of the, hint of the madness in my eyes. It is nearly a full moon. <laughs> oh, is that what it is? Yes. Oh, isn't a blood moon soon, did I read? There's something weird going on on Thursday. Oh, you'd think I'd know this sort of stuff with all my witchy shit. The only moon, you'll see this moon once every thousand years. It's the same moon. It's but the same... in that particular configuration. Oh, interesting. It was like okay. an eclipsy, moony thing. Ooh. Oh, that's why everyone's going a bit mad. Uh, so I won't sleep. You'll go insane. Yes. More so. I'm a wolf. <laughs> okay, you've just decided. I've just decided. That's I'm, how werewolfism... That's how I'm going to do it. Lycanthropy, if you will. That's the actual word for it. Rather than werewolfism. Or werewolfism. Were- werewolfing. <laughs> to werewolf. Shall we werewolf today? <laughs> Things have dumbed down recently, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but any poisonings this week, planned or unplanned? Planned or, or unplanned. Mm. Uh, no. The blood moon, we'll see what it brings. Well, yes, there are lots of possibilities. I might go and skipping in the under the under the blood moon and collect some <laughs> bale for herbs, essentially. <laughs> Very lyrical, yes. I like that. Uh, indeed, I might, be, I might be doing that. I, going, I was convinced you were going to go, I'm going to go skipping under a bridge. <laughs> there might be some bale for herbs under a bridge. I, was I will fight a troll. Yes, exactly. Um, I was confusing trolls. Perhaps with I am the troll. The, the, troll slash werewolf. <laughs> I mean, what a combination. Oh, yeah, be, this is very exciting. I'm looking forward to this. Well, speaking of baying at the full moon and uh, skipping under bridges to find herbs and to play with trolls, mm-hmm. I think it's time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Indeed we should. So thank you very much to Susie Giraldi. So I'm not sure if we're going to pronounce this name right. Uh, uh, oh, I have no <laughs> idea. I don't know. I think it's Roxy or uh, Ruva. Yeah. R O U X V E. Wonderful sounding name if we knew what it sounded like. Lang. Yes. <laughs> So sorry if you're not you pronouncing the your name. Bit, right? Yes, I'm so sorry if you're not pronouncing your name. Please send us a message and tell us how to pronounce it, and we'll say it into the microphone several times for your ASMR needs. Yes, and to Megan. Megan. There are, there are many E's there, so I'm assuming it's Megan. Thank you, you very, very sexy, sexy Patreon subscribers. Thank you for joining us. Mm-hmm. It's been fun over in Patreon this week. We did a biggie. We did. One I was not expecting you to do. I know. We we did cover the story of Ed Gein mm. over on Patreon. Famous, famous, famous man who also liked to go a bit crazy on a full moon. This is true. true. It was later found out. Lots of bits of his history... And the the insanity that was his crimes, but it's a really interesting story. Really enjoyed it this week, yeah, actually. Good one. Yeah, good one. so there we go. So you if, like that one? You yeah, might like this one. Are there nipple belts? You'll never know. You'll find out. I'll never know. If I never <laughs> well, know, no, you will know. You will know in about <laughs> half an hour. It's the story of the nipple belt. It went on its travels. <laughs> That's dark. It That's is very, dark. very upsetting. <laughs> yes, well, if you want to know what the hell we're talking about, yeah. it's a wonderful time to go and join us on Patreon if you so wish. Mm. Patreon also makes a wonderful Christmas gift for a fan <laughs> or for a friend. We did have a few people last year. This is true. Year. I don't know why I'm sniggering. It's yeah. absolutely, it's a grand idea. They're able, you can buy, pay monthly. You can actually buy a year's subscription if you want to. And Patreon is completely flexible, so you can come and go as you please, but plenty of extra content on there for your listening needs. Well, Nick. Mm. Are you ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison? Mm. Or, mm. or we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. I would like a cocktail. You would like a cocktail? And I would like a story. I'm telling the story. You're okay. telling... <laughs> yes, because I was about to go, I have written nothing this week, <laughs> Nick. I can tell you stories. They will ramble and go nowhere. They always do. It's a usual Sinead episode. Yes, I had an onion on my belt. And people were killed. Sensational. <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> Should we go with the first yes, one? Yes, let's do whatever that one was. Yes, okay, go. Go, we'll go with the first one. We're going to drink cocktails and talk about poison. Hooray, 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 because it's Nick's story this week. And as you know, we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have any stories without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell and will flavour our cocktail of the week. So with Nick's story this week, mm. he chose a secret ingredient. Mm. And tis... Tis. It is a nice bit of pork. Nice bit of pork. Nice bit of pork. That's pork. what we like. <laughs> I like a bit of pork. I do like a bit of pork. I don't know why I have to say pork. 
Yeah, I know. Why are you saying pork? What are, what are you doing? What are you doing, Nick? <laughs> what are you doing to the English language? Yes, pork. It's a particular kind of cut of pork. pork a pork chop. A pork loin. Well, nothing particular is specified. No. Um, but we we will take from that what we will. Oh, we good. Bit of crackling. Bit of crackling. Ooh. Ooh could Ooh. use some crackling. Crackling, that's good. I like that. Yeah. But pork in a cocktail? It's not your traditional ingredient. I'll give you that. It I'll is not. I'll give you that. Yeah, that's Now, true. I was thinking, were you going to fat wash something? Well, we have done that before indeed so we have some bacony done, goodness we have done some bacony bourbon yes so but i thought we've done that before with some nondescript bit of pig meat <laughs> what well, i dare to ask have you come up with it's not overly nondescript in the cocktail so oh. we are in fact we're going to have a pork chop oh a pork chop we're gonna have a pork chop is it a drink or are we just gonna have some lovely lovely food <laughs> it is it is indeed a drink a little bit of mash and some gravy or that. The, the gravy can be the drink it's fine i'm not fussy <laughs> so i'll put a gravy in a lovely goop um, it'll be delightful <laughs> Oh yeah, with a, actually. With the Yorkshire pudding on a on a, on Stop a stick. Stop it! I'm getting getting a bit excited she's here. Getting, she's, she's rubbing her legs. Disturbingly. I know. <laughs> it's getting weird, everyone. I've not had dinner. Okay, a pork Sorry, chop. Having a pork chop. Pork chop named for the drag queen, either. I don't know. Uh, is is that a thing? Yes, a famous ex contestant of RuPaul's Drag you Race. You know, I do not watch that. But you love it, really. No, I'm a terrible gay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let us skip, if you will, into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick, a pork chop. Yeah. I'm worried. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a drink that I feel uh, I should apologise before, we, before uh, we've tried it. To describe the look of it, people will see the it's... image when it comes out this evening. So, it, it, it's got a beautiful, interesting garnish, carrying on the herb theme. Well, indeed, yes. It has a... a garnish of thyme. Mm-hmm. And I'm not gonna lie the drink looks like a cross between some fat and or like a really pale gravy porky porky goodness (laughs) i mean i might love this if it's a nice pork gravy prepared earlier so oh my god um yeah it does not look like an appetizing color it really does look like some sort of savory soup (laughs) tasty tasty soup the evil glint in your eye I'm worried. I'm drinking it too. I know. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I think we just got to dive in yep. to whatever this is. Happy Christmas. Happy Enjoy Christ- your pork chop. Okay. Happy Christmas pork chop. Okay. Tasty, tasty. Oh, oh what? What? Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. What? Actually, not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I just, I had no idea what the taste was going to be. <laughs> My brain had literally prepared me to taste pork gravy. <laughs> It doesn't taste anything like pork gravy. No, it's really sharp and citrusy, but it looks thick and claggy. And I was like, it was going to be creamy or it's going to be porky. And it's so the... confused. It's like getting your equilibrium back after you've been on a boat. You need to sort of like your inner ear needs to settle. Okay, now I can go back in. That is nowhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. It's got something going on, though. <laughs> it's got something going on. It's got something going on. Would you get to hazard a guess at the something going on? Well, a lot of citrus in there. I think, is it lime? Rather it is than not lime. Is it lemon then? It is lemon. So it's lemon. Sorry, I need to take a third sip. You oh. have as many sips as you like. It, yeah. I don't know. It's very, very hard to separate the taste away from the way it looks. So my brain is going... Close your eyes, dear. Close your eyes. Think of England. I might actually do that because I keep <laughs> saying there's meat in this. There's no meat. There's I guarantee no meat in it. It is entirely... Yes, it is vegan. It's, it's even vegan. It's not vegan, not right. Okay, vegetarian. so there's no cream in it or anything. There's no cream. Yeah. There's no eggs. But there's something weird. There's <laughs> something weird happening. Maybe it's the time. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's got a really nice citrusy start. Really sharp and lovely. But then it's I don't I don't know how to describe it. I I swear to God the first thing that comes to my mind is something like petrol, but that's wrong. They, I guarantee there's no petrol. No, I know there's no this. petrol, but you know that sort of fumigated, like you know, like the fumes or something. There's something lingering that's hollow. Essence I don't know. Of diesel. Yes, I don't no. know what is in it. Put me out of my misery. Okay, well you correctly vaguely guess lemon. Lemon. Hey, <laughs> bourbon. Oh, there's some bourbon in it. Base oh. of bourbon. We have some cider. Oh, some cider. Apple cider. Apple cider. Which is also nice. going to be a bit of a twang to it. Nice. I mean, it is not only thyme as a garnish, but it is shaken with some thyme as well. Okay. So there's actually thyme in the shaker. A bit sugar. of sugar syrup. Sugar, sugar, sugar. And we have a final ingredient, which is the one that you may be struggling to put your finger on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mustard. Fuck off. What? Some lovely Dijon. Some Dijon. That's it. That's, that's <laughs> it. Now you've said it. 
But you know what I mean? The heat of kind of and the sort of vapor esque. <laughs> that's why I was. That's why I said petrol. It didn't. It doesn't taste like petrol or diesel, but it had a vapor to it. It had a heat and sort of thing. Had a warmth. A warmth. It doesn't taste hot. It doesn't no. not taste hot. Well, it's, it's a diesel. It's not like an English master, which will blow your head off. But um, <laughs> but yeah, we have some mustard, which works perfect. Which is a delightful with a pork chop, some nice apples, this is some weird. mustard, <laughs> lovely pork chop, and some and thyme. Some thyme works beautifully with a pork chop. <laughs> I quite like it. <laughs> you don't. You quite like it because it's the basis of a jus. That's what it is. No, it's not. It's basically you put this in a pan on the stove. It's a lovely hot sauce to pour <laughs> over some pork chops. That's what it is. It's a bit of squeeze of citrus in there, some lemon, a bit of bourbon for a bit of flavour, and then it's fu- fucking mustard and thyme. <laughs> We're just drinking cold gravy. No, we're not drinking cold gravy. <laughs> I'm not objecting to it. Ah, oh, heathen. <laughs> this is weird. It's not unpleasant. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's not one for your everyday oh. drinking, I, I grant you. <laughs> and but it's... These, we've had a mustard cocktail before, which, which was, which was uh, entirely vile. Which we should um, never be spoken of. But this is... Yeah, it's not half bad. It it really isn't. It really isn't. Yeah, it's I'm, just ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's entirely stupid. You keep going yeah. back for more. That's the thing, because you're like, what? What is this? What? 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 I have no objections to that. What well, it is it's so much nicer than I thought it was going to be. Now you've said it, I can taste it, Dijon. Now you've said it. See, now, you said, now I've said it, you don't like it. No, I like it. <laughs> I just know it's there. I know that was the thing. I like it because I'm a bit of a, a what would be the word for it? A total piece of trash that <laughs> I would drink. I love some Dijon mustard. Exactly. I would. I, I love Dijon mustard. I eat that with a spoon. I'll lick it from, not, not whole spoonfuls. I'm not completely insane. But yeah, I'll, I'll drink a bit of cold gravy. I love a bit of sauce. And this is just an alcoholic sauce. This is what it is. The, the look of it. And knowing there's mustard in it defies logic, but it works. <laughs> I have to say, the look, the, the mustard gives it that sort of cloudy yeah, countenance. Yeah, and, and it does is, look like is, a pale gravy. Yeah, which is not which is not what you really want in a cocktail. You want a nice, crisp, sort of clear beverage. <laughs> so it doesn't look particularly lovely. You know what? Give it a go, people. Yeah. Definitely give it a go. I'm going to drink it. It's perfectly pleasant. I don't know what will happen to me after I've drunk it. <laughs> so there we go. It's just so the pork chop cocktail. If you heat that up, pour it over some mash... You're in flavour country. <laughs> <laughs> You're in a flavour town. No, it's a country. It's an entire country. Oh, entire country. Yeah, it's that much flavour. Okay. okay, Nick, I love Good. it. I don't know how I feel about the flavours, but I love it anyway. Pulled it out of the bag there. <laughs> well, with the pork chop firmly in hand. Chop. With the pork chop. Is it time for a story? It most certainly is. <laughs> it most certainly is time for a story. Good, because I'm incredibly giggly now after that. <laughs> this is going to be a rollercoaster, people. So, well, before we start this story, okay. I, have to have, I have two announcements. One, it gets grim at the end. Oh, oh. So beware. Okay. Second, I apologise for my pronunciation of foreign places. Okay, good. Because I'll get them wrong. So today, I'm going to tell you a tale okay. of a man who has been largely forgotten about, really. Even in his native land, in Poland. We're going to Poland. <gasps> oh, Poland! We haven't been to Poland. Indeed. Have we been to Poland? I don't believe so. No, I don't Not believe so. Not on the main episode, I don't think. I don't think so. A chap who, at the time, was considered one of the greatest monsters to have ever lived. Well, Frankenstein's monster. No. Oh, okay. Entirely different type of monster. Ooh, so yeah. today we have the story of Carl Denker. Ooh. So are you familiar with Carl Denker? I think it's a name that is cropped uh, up. So it may be in the research for p- potential episodes. The pile. The pile yeah. of names that we just go, yes, that person probably Not at some point. Not someone who I had come across before, mm. just in general knowings, but only through researching for the podcast. So yeah. Carl was born on the 10th of August, 1870, in a tiny little village in what was the time Lower Silesia, part of the German Empire. Nice. But yeah, that area is now part of Poland. He came from a family of... Respected and wealthy farmers, good salt of the earth, sort of lower working class, sort of chaps, hard working. He attended a local school, but it is soon obvious to most people that um, Carl was not destined for an academic future. Couldn't get through um, the door. Really, he hated school and really struggled with his lessons. His teachers, say, not the most sort of understanding or supportive of tutors, declare him an idiot and beat him when he does not understand the lessons that they are trying to trying to teach. That's a harsh first day, I'd think. <laughs> Much the style of the time in the, in the 1870s. <laughs> if you don't understand something, you're obviously f- 
stupid fool and beating is the only way to get it into your head. I mean, um, that's the logic I use in my workplace as well. This is wildly unpopular. <laughs> Despite his really miserable time at school, Carl actually does have one love while he's growing up, Aww. and that is the outdoors. Um, he is never happier than he when he's working on the farm um, mm. or just out and about in nature. That's when he's in his element and he loves it. Nice. Um, so much so that at the age of 12, um, he quits school and runs away. And he runs away oh. to become an apprentice gardener. He's going to learn a trade. He's going to oh. work outdoors, work with plants and all that sort of things. Don't we all dream of that? Exactly. A delightful, delightful time. When we have a bad day in the office, we're going, I'm going to run away and become a gardener. I literally nearly had that breakdown <laughs> during lockdown when I was freelancing. Oh, you I, did, I remember. I, yes. I had a day where I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to take a Royal Horticultural Society course. I'm going to learn to be a gardener. I looked at it and went, oh, I should not do this whatsoever. But I had texted everyone and said, that's it. I'm going to become a gardener. That's it. I'm like, Put down the gym. He stayed away from home doing his gardening for 13 years. But even How big that, was that garden? I think he may have moved on to one or two other gardens. Oh, good. Right. Okay. During his time. His family had sort of been keeping track of him, keeping an eye on him, see where he is, making sure he was all okay. And when his father dies in 1895, it's, it's quite quickly that he's notified and he quickly makes his way back to the family farm. You are making it out that his family was following him around. <laughs> yeah, they're behind bushes. They're there like, with shrubs behind in front of them, sort of creeping up. It's, it's very clear. Clandestine. He's one day just digging the soil and his mother just goes, your father's died. What? You were there the whole time? <laughs> After his father's death, um, his older brother takes control of the family farm. But Carl is left with a, with a decent inheritance. And he Ooh. uses this windfall to buy a farm of his own. Nice. Lies, he has his own land. It's great. He can just live and be happy and... We'll live the good lovely. life. Live yeah. the good life, exactly. Now have a nice small holding. Unfortunately. What? Why? What? Well, I mean, as good as Carl is with the, the practical side of things... He is not so good at the business side of things. A farm is a business. Mm. You've got to earn a living out of it. You've got to make some money out of it. Yes. And that's where he really falls down. Oh, he, he's not good about books and figures and stuff like that. Ugh. He doesn't. He's not interested in that. He wants to be out there planting things and looking after animals and stuff. So unfortunately, the farm does not fare too well. Nee. Um, and eventually he is forced to sell the land. Now, with his much dwindled funds, he buys himself a house in the town of Munsterberg. Munsterberg, known today as Zbiche. Again, pronunciation, I apologise. But at the time, Munsterberg. It is a very nice two-storey house. It's it's still there today. Ooh. It has a decent garden to it and a few outbuildings. That um, sounds idyllic. Well, indeed, he's able to keep a couple of pigs. And <laughs> so he very much enjoys his, his sort of like farming and, and gardening. So he's able to keep his hand in, yeah. um, in the outside sort of life. This is what all of us are aspiring well, to. Well, absolutely. Again, post-lockdown, all we want is a house, a small garden and yep. a few animals that we can tend to with some pigs some exactly. pigs that we he's, shall rear well precisely he's, he's got a couple of pigs he's got so he's able to grow some vegetables and stuff like that he's having a lovely time he's got a bit of money left over from the sale of the farm yeah. he's self-sustained so he's having the time of his life now the town that he moves to is, is a relatively small place really the population of around 9,000 people so quite quite small and as Carl becomes more embedded in the life of the community he becomes more and more popular he takes to playing the organ at the local church he carries the cross during right. funeral services <laughs> so he's so he's in he's embedded in the community really he's part of the fabric of the place whose organ did he play <laughs> oh, so funny i've been sitting on that for about 30 seconds <laughs> <laughs> He, he cares about his neighbours and he does what he can to help people out. One thing that people talk about him, he, he doesn't drink, he doesn't have relationships with women, he doesn't con consort with the Ew, with, with yeah, those no. people, none yeah. of that, none of that. Ugh. And he is one of the people that people will go to, they need help with anything, Carl is the first port of call. And nice people guy. around town start calling him Papa Danka. Papa Danka. So Father Danka, he's, he's the one, Aww. the reliable, nice chap. This is the point at which I go, <laughs> what could this mean, Nick? Where where is this going? And <laughs> I have no it idea possibly. where it's well, going. Well, indeed, you don't know, do you? Ah, oh, yes. What a nice man. No one would have known. His house is, is situated quite near to the town's train station. And one day, Papa Danka notices that there's there's beggars and sort of vagrants and travellers. They seem to congregate in this area around the train station. Now, they're either waiting for a train to take them onto pastures new somewhere, or they're waiting for trains to arrive, perhaps in the hope of a few coins from some wealthier passengers and things. Yeah. But that's where they seem to, to congregate. Now, he is by no means a rich man. He lives a sort of modest 
lifestyle, but in his Christian and caring way he offers many of these unfortunate people perhaps a place to stay for the night if it's particularly cold out. Mm. He'll say, come and come and stay in the house, here's a hot meal. There's always an odd job that he's doing perhaps around the house or in the garden or with the animals, or he knows someone else in town who perhaps needs some work doing for a few coins. He's and the most noble man well, in all of time! Exactly. It's adorable. Well, at some point, Carl decides to open a small shop, and he rents a building next door to his house. Now, in the store, he sells produce from his garden, has a few animals, so he's able to sell pork and other pig-based treats. That's um, it, is it? You just wait. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Um, Pig-based treats, great. Pig-based treats. Okay. From his limited time as a father previously, he made a few connections with other, other farmers and things in the area. Indeed. And he is able to offer leather goods, sort of belts and shoelaces, braces in good his little general store. store. The no, general, yeah, exactly, nice, a bit of a nice. general store. Business is good. It's not fantastic. He's not the most popular store in town, but it is a bit of an income. Supplements his savings. He's having a grand old time. It's idyllic, but then it all comes crashing down with the outbreak of the First World War. Oh, those bastards. Yeah. Now, as far as we know, Carl is not called up to fight at all. He would have been sort of mid-40s um, mm. at the time of the outbreak, so probably a bit old for the for the army. Yeah. But the, the war still has its impact on the, the quiet little town of Munzburg. Food becomes incredibly hard to come by. And Carl's little store does a brisk business with, with people getting whatever they could from anyone who had anything to spare, really. Mm-hmm. As I said, the town is about 60 kilometres south of the city of Roklo, Poland. And it's on one of the main train lines. So soldiers who have been injured in the war, they're often stopping there, waiting for connecting trains and things like that. So the sort of the homeless vagrant community starts to starts to increase and blossom slightly oh. um, during this time. Also, people whose homes have been destroyed, they're fleeing yeah. conflict and things. They have nowhere else to go, and they seem to find their way either ending up in Musterberg or go certainly passing through. Now, after the war ends and Germany has was defeated, the until was, the sequel. <laughs> The country was hit by hyperinflation. Yeah. They struggle to deal with the huge debts it's racked up during the war um, mm. and the, the punishing reparations from the Treaty of Versailles demanded by the Allies. Before the war, one dollar would get you between four and five marks. Yeah. One dollar. By 1923, one dollar was worth four trillion, two hundred and ten billion, five hundred million marks. <laughs> <laughs> That's math I can't even oh, do. Well, indeed, I actually had to Google how to pronounce that number. <laughs> Did you? Yes. Oh my god! Because <laughs> I thought because it was just obviously just a number, and I was like, "How does that even? How? how I how? don't know where the billions and the trillions and the millions go." And I, <laughs> how does that even work? I mean, it, someone came in with a dollar. <laughs> It is just crazy, crazy money. I mean, there are stories of people going to like buy a loaf of bread in Berlin mm. with a wheelbarrow full of cash. Yes. Full of notes. And really, everything descends into a sort of a shiny bead bartering system. Even the Treaty of Versailles, they are repaying that in tons of coal. Marks mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. At, the, at yeah. this the point. Currencies are decimated, really. And, yeah, and people indeed. are kind of, okay, how, how do we survive? Well, exactly. I mean, Carl has been living off his savings, really, off mm. his the money he's got in a, in a wee little bank account, and it is now entirely worthless. Money means nothing. Money means absolutely nothing. I, I remember doing this period at school. <laughs> of course you did. Oh, yes, they had to pay, like, the Treaty of Versailles in tons. But you think of the actual, a little chap who ran a shop, mm. his entire life savings were wiped out and worth not even pennies. It's a common anxiety dream, but it's, a, it's it could be a reality any time, mm. really. All of your wealth, whatever you have, can just suddenly turn to nothing. Yeah. And it happened fairly recently. <laughs> Well, indeed. So everything Carl has saved over the year is wiped out. He is forced to sell his home. And the investors who buy the building from him convert it into apartments. So it's a, it's a sizable building, so they're able to split it into Shows, into, into, yeah. into sort of apartments. And Carl is forced to rent two rooms on the ground floor of the house he used to own. Oh no! So that's going to do your ego a bit of a bit of damage, as you, yeah. yourself, your pride. But in a characteristically Papa Denka way, he still finds time to help those less fortunate than him. There are still a great many injured people, people out of work, homeless people who need his assistance. Hmm. Now, despite living in much more modest accommodations, he still offers shelter and perhaps a hot meal to those he could. Turns out, though, that not all his guests were were to leave his home. Oh, they just liked it so much they that just they loved stayed. It so much they, that stayed they stayed and they, they, they got stayed married and they were and they happy ever after, and they right, Nick? Forever. Oh, good God. 
Carl is able to keep his little shop open throughout all this economic crisis, and he's doing a brisk trade. But the, the, the garden and the space for the animals has, has, has gone, what? swallowed up by the development of, of his, yeah. his former home. It's now strange that the shop never seems to be lacking provisions, really. Oh, if anything, oh, there's, there's more, more on the shelves than there was before. Oh, Jesus um, Christ! Stock now seems so plentiful. Carl goes door to door. Um, selling his wares. Um, He even gets on a train and goes to Roclaw, where he's been granted a license by the Butcher's Guild to sell pork in the city markets. No! His jars of skinless pickled pork are particularly popular. That escalated (laughs) fast, Nick! I said it went to dark and scary places. Oh, my God! (laughs) Oh, okay, carry on. (laughs) Oh, my God. Well, you know what? You know, good meat... In that sort of time, it's no hard one's going to gonna ask questions. Well, when exactly. No one's going to ask too many questions. For People really are starving. Well-priced meat is something you can get, and if you've got a little supplier you who got can a supply? keep you hooked up, you're not going to ask questions you're of not, where it came from. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. This cocktail's getting worse. It gets worse. It definitely gets worse. <laughs> that goes very dijon very, very uh, quickly. I don't know if mustard is more of a solid substance. If it settles... I think it you do has. shaky, 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 and it emulsifies and goes into the. It's definitely the body. stronger. But as you leave it, it goes, it settles towards the bottom, yeah. so it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And I'm not going to finish that. <laughs> no, it starts off nice, but very quickly, keep swirling, absolutely keep swirling. not. Swirl, swirly, 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 swirly. On down or, in one. <laughs> down in one, or just heat it up, pour it over some pork chops. You're fine. If you want another drink, go get. I'm going to have another drink. <laughs> I'm going to pause. This is, this is a good, appropriate pausing moment. Okay, pausing, 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 because obviously I'm now just traumatised by the man with the meat. I'm going to leave you with the trauma. Um, <laughs> come back shortly. And we're back. Yes, we did have to go and make another drink. That, the cocktail that we were like, yeah, it's absolutely fine at the start. It separates people. Yeah. It separates when you've left it on the side for a little bit. Gets strong at the bottom. But what okay. we did do instead, yes. we made an alternative beverage mm. using... Some of the bacon wash bourbon that I had left in the cupboard. So I Woo-hoo! feel entirely justified to continue the pork based theme. Piggy based of theme. Of the cocktail. So we've made a red hooks with bacon washed bourbon. And it's bloody and delicious. And it's bloody oh, marvellous. God, it's so good. <laughs> the Red Hook is possibly the greatest discovery of this podcast. Even though it's been around for, for years and years, we wouldn't have discovered it unless we had done this podcast. And it is one of the best drinks of all time. And that bloody bacon washed bourbon. Mm. Mm. I've got to make some more of that. Oh no, I've got to make, got to make bacon. Oh no, what a You have to make a load of bacon and then oh, put it in no. bourbon? Your life is so hard. <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible life I lived. Anyway. On with the story. Pork man is plying his trade. It is December 21st. Okay. 1924. Close to Christmas. And a homeless vagrant mm. named Vincenzo Olivier nice. appears at the Munsterberg police station covered in blood. Oh. After officers have calmed him down slightly, Vincenz says that he's been attacked by Papadenka and has barely escaped from the apartment with his life. And now another version of this says that Vincenz Olivia is screaming for help outside the apartment when he is found by a passing coachman named Gabriel, who then takes the injured man to the police station. Ooh. Do not know which is the correct version of events, but either way, he ends up at the police station. Officers are loath to believe this unknown beggar's story, really. Mm. Um, Karl Danker is a pillar of the community. Indeed. They refuse to believe that he will be involved in anything so so vile as an, as an attack on a homeless man. Well, you wouldn't um, think that if he's a good, not. upstanding member of the community. He's been benevolent. He's been kind. Who is this vagrant? Who mm. is this homeless person coming in and saying, oh, yeah, he totally assaulted me. Oh, he's just after money or he's after something else. Something <laughs> Why should we believe him? Accusation. But they have their procedures that they must follow. And so they do. Now, a doctor is called for. And after a medical examination, they, he confirms that uh, Vincenzo has indeed sustained a serious head wound oh. um, most likely from an axe or a, a large oh. blade so a considerable gash on, on the, the head <laughs> corroborating the, his claims that he has indeed been attacked good lord police are now obliged to go and have a conversation with Carl and when they arrive at the apartment Carl opens the door and quite freely admits that yes he had indeed hit Vincenzo with an axe mm. but he had done so in self-defence mm. Carl said he had invited Vincenzo Oliver into his home 
home. He was one of the, the homeless chaps who had been out by the station in the middle of December in Poland. It's going to be cold. Absolutely. Um, kind, so kind. Kind, kind, cold. Come in, get out of the snow, have a hot meal and on your way in the morning on your, on your train. I've made this cocktail that actually doubles up very well as a gravy. <laughs> Carl says the beggar then has the audacity to attempt to rob him. He Busted! Af- after he has already been given a handout, and as they have been struggling, Carl reached for an axe that he used for chopping firewood, and he swung a Vinces, hit him in the head, yeah. and the chap then fled. Now, the, the police are more than willing to accept this perfectly reasonable explanation, but rules are rules, and they take Denker down to the police station. Um, and they put him in a holding cell while the matter is investigated. Don't believe for a second that the, that Papadenka has anything anything untoward has happened. He has defended himself, but they must they must follow the procedure. Follow procedure as as they lock. Papadenka in the cell for the evening. They are full of apologies for the inconvenience and the embarrassment um, that this has undoubtedly caused him. Just, um, that's, a, that's a nice picture there. I'm so sorry. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I have to I do this. I'm so sorry. I'm looking I've got to I'm do so it. Sorry. I've got to do it. I have my shirt off my back. <laughs> they, they assure him that all this will be sorted out as quickly as possible. The thieving vagrant he is also being held for the attempted robbery, and mm. he is going to face swift justice for the attack on the the beloved Papadenka. No apologies for him. No apologies for him. At about 11.30 that evening, uh, Sergeant Polk goes in to check on their guest and perhaps take him a hot drink. He found Carl Denker dead. What? He has hanged himself in his cell. What? With a noose made from his own handkerchief. How big was the handkerchief? That's not the first uh, question I I should ask. I'm sorry. It's one of the first questions I asked myself. Apparently quite a large handkerchief. Was he a clown on the (laughs) side? (laughs) He has managed to form it into a noose and hang himself in his cell. Wow, that's a lot. You have to ask... I'm I'm sorry, I'm just obsessed with the handkerchief right now. (laughs) How big were handkerchiefs in Poland back then? They've got to go and look at the house, haven't they? They've got to go and look at the house and he's going... So wow. much so that he thinks he has to kill himself. Wow. They, well, what's going well, on? What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> Police are horrified by this discovery. Oh, no. Um, many are convinced that the, the reason for this is the humiliation of being locked up has, has caused um, Carl to take his own life. He had been a law-abiding man. He regularly attended church. He had never been into the police station before, apart from once or twice to drop off some of his deliciously pickled pork. <laughs> For him to be, you just love that I phrase, like, don't you? I like deliciously pickled pickle, pork. Pickle, pickle pork. <laughs> that would be the name of a shop if you opened it. It wouldn't sell pork. You would just call it that. <laughs> For him to have been suddenly spending a night behind bars, accused of such a violent attack. What are people going to think of him? It has obviously been all too much for him. and for he this has saintly taken... figure. Put blood on our hands, Well, exactly, and, and the, the police are horrified by this. It takes a couple of days, actually, for the authorities to track down his next of kin. Mm. Um, but they do. His brother's family are still living at the farm, the, the family farm. And on Christmas Eve, so the 24th, so three days later, his body is turned over to his relatives. And the police then go to Carl Donker's apartment to secure his belongings. Maybe they could find a will or a note or or something that would explain this very dramatic turn of events. The first thing that struck the investigators as they opened the door is the overpowering smell of vinegar. Oh, right. Awful lot of vinegar. But the soon they remember uh, Denker's famous jars of skinless pickled pork. Um, Uh, Delicious. That would explain the vinegar, they thought. Obviously, he's making this morning, noon and night. A yes. lot of vinegar involved. What they find more difficult to explain are the piles of bones oh, uh, um, found in Denker's bedroom. In his bedroom? In the, in the bedroom. In some bedroom. lovely pile, piles of bones on the floor. In a bedroom closet, they find um, some bloody blood-stained clothing neatly lined H- up. Hung in, up? In, hung up in the, in the closet there. Right. There is a report that is that was written... Um, using the discovering officer's statements. Now, I'm going to read part of this. Okay. It gets unpleasant and quite technical in some places, so so be warned. Those of sensitive disposition <laughs> maybe want to skip forward. Trigger warning. Most of our listeners, buckle in, guys. You're going to love this. <laughs> the first findings made in Denker's house during the search were bones and pieces of meat. Um, the later were in a salt solution found in a wooden drum. There were altogether 15 pieces with skin, Two parts of the breast, which is strongly hairy. The torso is cut through the middle, three fingers above the navel. Its lateral limit is the shoulder front blade. In the piece of the interior abdominal wall, the middle of the navel is visible. The remaining pieces belong to the side and back. The largest part is about 40 by 20 centimetres. Particularly striking was a very clean anus. 
with large <laughs> parts of both buttocks. Nick, I, I did not know that was coming, mate. Sorry. <laughs> Everything else led up to that. Very clinical. Very, very okay. Very they clinical. took such detail. It was yes. like, oh, then they went straight to the anus. Okay. There was a very clean anus with with part of the buttocks. With part of the buttocks. Dressing, if you will, was, was there. Was was, was found. <laughs> it was clean. To continue, the meat is brownish red and does not feel as if the body had would have lost much blood. On Ooh. the black, some soft bluish discoloration is vis- is visible, as well as liver mortis, which leads to the conclusion that the disassembly of the body took place several hours after death. Liver mortis, did you just say? Yes. Is that a thing? Well, it I've is never a heard thing. of that. I've never heard of that. It is a thing. It is a thing. Ooh. I think it's to do with the settling of the blood. Oh. I believe. Learned something new today. There is no evidence of vital reaction of the bodies to the cuts made, which means that the, the latter were not made while the victims were still alive, which is some small blessing, really. Nevertheless, some skin and muscles from the neck are missing, as well as extremities, arms, legs, heads, sexual organs, all missing. Lesions could not be determined, nor the nature or the tool of the crime. In three medium-sized pots filled with cream sauce, um, some mm-hmm. cooked meat, partially covered with skin and human human hair was found the meat was pink and soft all pieces seemed cut from the 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 buttocks the buttock area one pot only had a half a portion denka must have eaten the other piece shortly before being arrested they do say the buttock is the meatiest part that they do that you should they do. start with the buttock if anyway. you have to eat a human being if you're trapped in the andes and you're stranded and everything start with the buttocks yeah well they're, they're fleshy aren't they fleshy and muscly in a so, cream sauce in a cream sauce this is making the cocktail you made earlier <laughs> m- much much better. i had decided on the, po- on the cocktail before i had got to this part of the story um, and i slightly regretted it afterwards so, so in in a shed attached to his little shop, they found a, a, a barrel full of bones that have been picked clean of tendons and muscle. Oh, Part God. of a leg was found in a pond that Denker had dug in the garden many years previously. Oh, yeah. um, and in a small wood near the house, they found parts of a spine and a pelvis covered in sore marks. Wow. Okay. All the bones and fragments that have been discovered are sent to the University of Roklaw for examination. The staff there attempt to reconstruct the skeletons as much as they can, and in the remains of the, the skulls, they are able to identify evidence of, of blunt force trauma. Mm. Huge damage to, to the skull. <laughs> Looks to them as if these people have been killed by a massive blow to the head. Um, potentially by the, the head, handle of an axe wow. or such like. Because he doesn't want to damage the skin? Well, so, or... well I don't know. I think it's convenient less messy I sp- yes i guess yeah. is gonna if the bladed part is gonna blood everywhere and stuff blood like spatter. that just a, a massive wallop to the head as police continue their investigations they find a loose panel um in the bedroom behind which they find a fabric coin bag two tin boxes and three paper bags all containing human teeth he hid those? He hid the teeth. He hid the teeth. Um, they are sorted and organised by type and size amongst the containers. That's a um, terrible day. Molars in that. the coin bag in sizes in another. Oh my God. A total of 351 teeth. Okay, so how many, how many teeth are in the human body? There are, I believe, 32. 32. So 10, 10... Well, as the teeth are examined, a Professor Euler comes to the conclusion that the teeth come from at least 25 different people. Because there are multiples of sort of um, molars and things like that yeah. that you wouldn't, so you can't just divide the three hundred fifty one by thirty two. So he he estimates there are a minimum of twenty five teeth from twenty five different people here. He notes that all the teeth have come from adults, nearly all of whom being over forty. So there are no children, predominantly male. Small no doubt, blessings. These these homeless vagrants who he has been welcoming into his home for a for a hot meal. They are his chosen victims his further experiments are revealed as they go through his his clothing and in a slight foreshadowing of Sinead's patreon episode from this week <laughs> they they find a belt made of human skin Way! that still has the nipples attached no! i was joking yeah. <laughs> i was joking earlier oh a foreshadower of Ed Gein. Indeed. Shoelaces made with woven human hair. What the actual shit? <laughs> what? That is that's, dark. That's dedication for you. To weave your shoelaces from human hair. On some loose sheets of paper, they find the names of 30 men and women, along with the date. Oh, he's actually kept a record he's of it a then. a record. Good, good, good. At good. entry 31, there is only a date. 21st of December, 
1924. That's when he was caught. Which is the date that Vincennes rushed into the police station. Oh my god. Screaming he was being attacked. He'd already written out the entry. Already written. He hadn't written the, he'd written out the date. He hadn't written out the name. He knew though what was going to happen. What he was going to do. It now became somewhat clear as why Karl Denke had taken his own life. Um, <laughs> the, the slightest investigation into him would have revealed everything. Yeah. Um, once he invited someone into his apartment and they had witnessed the horrors that were just lying around yeah. uh, for everyone to see, he obviously did not expect them to leave alive. <laughs> now, as the borders changed after the war, the German Empire collapsed, records got lost, the town changed its name from, Munz, um, from Munsterberg to Zivice, becomes part of Poland, then during the chaos of the Second World War, the name Karl Denker and the details of his crime were almost entirely lost. Yeah. to history we will never know the exact number of his victims we will never know when he started we will never know what his motives were for doing such terrible things there are so many unanswered questions but he lingers in those random newspaper records police records and he is now known as the forgotten cannibal wow story of carl denker yay <laughs> what a story <laughs> I mean, the ending of that genuinely is terrifying, Nick. Is Oh, Christ, yes. <laughs> we, we just, because all the records are lost, we don't know. But don't know. what the hell happened with that guy? There's no explanation whatsoever. And there could have been. Okay, absolutely. I mean, there is there are some theory, theories that he did it purely for profit. Mm. He, he needed to make some money. People needed food. Desperate times. People weren't going to miss these homeless people, these vagrants wow. that he was invited in. So if they went missing, no one's going to care. No one did care. No. no one reported them missing until, until Vincennes got free. So wow. was that his motive? Purely a financial motive? Mm. Purely a, he wanted to keep up his reputation of being a bit of a saviour sort of character and he had this food that he could give or sell relatively cheaply to people so he needed a source for that yeah. there are some there are some reports that i read that he actually all this started his first victim was was back, way back in like 1906 before the which, war be, way yes. before any before the war before, before, before like, there was any war <laughs> before any of this so if that were true there was only one report i read that's, yeah. that had that that date on there so if that were true then what the hell were his, were his motives all the way back from from then so yeah, you just don't know i think the idea that he was purely doing this for the greater good you know to the greater good the greater good the greater good during the war absolutely desperate times the economy is absolutely rack and ruin afterwards how do you survive mm. meat is meat is just the, the most amazingly priceless commodity it's like absolutely. oh my god you know how can you actually get hold of it the idea that he's doing that just for the greater good and suddenly decided to do that i don't think that happens is, no. he, is he doing it for his own personal survival well, and he's finding an excess and he's finding people are coming to him and going oh you're marvelous how fantastic you are giving me this these your spares mm. um and therefore he gets a liking for people coming to him and going oh aren't you marvelous giving me all this stuff well so um, he you, you think that he he suddenly thinks that okay this is a homeless person then human meat okay we've got to eat something because if he's been something. a farmer and if you've been someone who lived off the land you go okay a pig or a what's the difference between a pig and a human being some people genuinely feel that yeah. that's why they don't eat animals we'll kill this person and then everyone goes oh, we love this so much, and then he suddenly thinks he's providing a service and gets carried away with himself. I would understand that, apart from the shoelaces made from human well, hair yes, and, and the belt of nipples. The them, belt them, of nipples them, has them. returned. I mean, yeah, I mean, but is that some sort of <laughs> nose-to-tail eating, as it were? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, we'd need to talk to most of the local butchers that we know. Nose to tail dining. Now you've ruined that for everyone. <laughs> but you know, use every part of the animal. Oh, cool. You can um, use if you're going to kill an animal, then you use every piece that is possible uh, for you to use. It's a, it's a war effort. It's, you know, it's, it's desperate times. And it's it. desperate times. Is that what it is? Is that it's or a, it's a is valid it argument? Just fun? Well, one thing I was going to say is that through the House of Horrors, and this has such shades of Ed Gein. Completely. In, so much more than I'd realised when I started doing it's it. It's a wonderful companion piece. I mean, genuinely this week, guys, if you know, as ever, this was the time to go and, and subscribe to Patreon to listen to the Ed Gein story. It's terrifyingly similar. We know far more 
more about Ed Gein because obviously that happened in the 50s yeah. and this is the records are lost sadly so we can't really investigate as much into it yes okay go through the house of horrors and there's the bones piled up and there's all of these bits and pieces that you could probably pass off as pickling and preserving and doing these bits and pieces keeping the anus um, <laughs> it's not a delicacy that I'm aware of but maybe we don't know I mean, maybe we don't know the human anus could be could a be delicacy. Delicious. You don't know until you've tried it. And well, then, like, what happens exactly. if you do and it's the best thing ever, you know? So hopefully it's not. It was the secret panel where the teeth it were was hidden. the hidden teeth. The hidden teeth. Now, why the hidden teeth? I do not know the history of being able to track someone's DNA through teeth. You can identify them through teeth. He has taken the time to kill all these people but then put the teeth in little trinket bags and boxes and, and sort, put them sort behind them out into, yes. into sort of these are the molars these are the incisors and these are yeah. the different shapes and things you often hear sort of Why would ser- you do serial that? killers keep a keep a trophy it's or something trophy. from their from their from their victims and this does seem to be that seems to be something that has been kept um where everything else has been sort of sold in the shop or given to friends yeah. <laughs> and stuff like I mean, that is it, oh, uh, but God, these I... those bits are particularly sort of precious if you're dealing with livestock if you're dealing with this kind of production line maybe you do have a little cute thing where you you get oh i keep a pig's tooth every time i kill one well, or i think like that's very, i think that's thing. very different because that's if you no, but if he's if he's thinking in that mentality um, um, yes. if he's thinking in that mentality he's just going this is these people are pigs well, maybe so. to be slaughtered yes. These people are chickens or pigs or lambs or cows, whatever, to be slaughtered. Maybe that's his mentality behind well, it. Well, that's the thing, because no one was ever able to question him, to wow. ask him why or anything. He he knew the gig was up. As soon as he was in that cell, he thought, someone's going to go into my house. I've, I'm, I've had it. But isn't that a big signifier in its way? Well, I suppose, yeah, absolutely, because I see he knew what he was doing he was what incredibly he was wrong. Doing. That's insanity out the window, yeah. because he can't sit there and go, I just thought I was doing the right thing while rocking back and forth. He yeah. was in there, hanged himself with a handkerchief. Exactly. However big that handkerchief was, I know it's a point we keep <laughs> labouring, he bloody was determined to die, yeah. indicates he knew what he was doing. Uh, yeah, he knew what he was doing was Whoa. entirely illegal. So, yeah, I mean, a, a fascinating and terrifying case that yeah the forgotten cannibal oh, i did i think i twigged halfway through that yeah. and I, then i suddenly realized that i'd seen probably in my many scrollings of the this is the horrible thing that is our internet history we have to scroll through <laughs> serial killers and murderers of all ages and all times and the most interesting ones that people on a podcast would find interesting and i think i remember seeing flashing up mm. this serial killer who killed himself before he could ever stand trial one more point what's interesting oh, is that do. if you if you google him there are there are two photographs mm. there there is there is one photograph taken when he was alive and he looks like a perfectly ordinary chap there is another photograph taken after he's dead yes um in his coffin and if he does not look like the he's a fucking vampire in a coffin he does he looks, I've seen, that's he the just one looks I've seen. utterly terrifying yes just like cross yeah in, in in this coffin and he looks utterly vampiric okay well this will of, be the the, so. the image that we use for the for the podcast as well i will say uh, when you were telling the story the film delicatessen have you uh, seen it i have yes uh, one of my favorite films absolutely love it by jean-pierre jeunet who's that's the same the person who directed amelie delicatessen is a story that is set in this post-apocalyptic world mm. with a tenement building with a butcher who kills people for human meat because of a war. There we go. And a lot of what you said is scarily similar. Yeah. It's really weird. And mm. how many people did he supply meat to well, who we'll did know. not <laughs> ask questions? What was, was interesting, actually, there's another thing. That the following year, the, the demand for pork fell <laughs> just massively. <laughs> <laughs> there actually there there was there were stories of like pig farmers and things having wow. to sell entire herds. What's that? I don't know what the collective noun for a pig is. What is um, a collective noun for a pig? <laughs> <laughs> flock, a flock of pigs. I'm gonna no. look it up. Carry on. <laughs> Everyone, no one wanted pork. No one would buy on the risk of the does this contain people? So oh was, my god! Oh, apparently it's a drift or a drove. A drove of pigs. A drove of pigs. Yeah, yeah, well, there, there we go. Are, there we are. There, we, we, are, there we are. After, There's that old thing, isn't it? Does human meat out. taste like chicken or pork? And a lot of people <laughs> say it tastes of pork. I did read an article once. If there was a chef going, okay, if you had to cook a human body, you have to cook it like pork. You have to pickle it. <laughs> yes. You have to pickle it. No, not pickle it. They didn't pickle it. They didn't pickle it. They did some lovely, roasty, roasty loveliness to it. Don't. Don't, don't cook a human do body. That. 
don't do that. But what do you think, people? It's a great story. It is bizarrely crazy. And why don't we talk about this as much Ooh. as we do Ed Gein and all the other crazy cannibal? So much worse. I mean, so much worse, so much worse. Ed Gein just grave robbed, which is awful. Potentially killed two people. This yes. chap is in the 30s, potentially. And there's no films about him. Mm. Maybe there are lots of films about him. But still, not not good ones. Not ones I have seen. <laughs> Tell us what you think of the story. Tell us your theories. Do you think he knew what he was doing the whole way through? Is that why he killed himself? Or do you think he was serving the greater good? The greater good. Does human flesh taste like chicken or pork or beef? Or does it taste like some, like tofu? <laughs> that would be upsetting. I mean, if it tasted like tofu, yeah. the vegans would be very upset. Yeah, I'd be upset. So we will put out the recipe for the pork chop cocktail oh. this evening. Uh, it started off well. It went downhill. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, I think Sinead is right. If you're going to have it, knock it back in one or drink it quickly. Don't let it settle. It's an interesting one to experiment with. It may be one of those quirky ones that we wish we'd never done. It is a metaphor for this episode, if anything. <laughs> <laughs> Start sense. experimenting and then just go, no, this was a bad this idea. This was a bad idea. But yet a few of you will go, no, let's do it. And you're all serial killers. Yeah, well, indeed. You never know. You might like it. Give it a go. Take a sip of it and you don't like it. Warm it up and use it as a sauce, and <laughs> then make a red hook. With this. I freaking love a good gravy. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm Irish. I like a pig-based meal with potato and a good sauce with it. Excuse me, all the hell yeah, okay. that you've just created the best gravy ever, well, but it's cold. I, I'm okay. Well, my, my life is now complete. I'm, Can we get pork chops and make this? <laughs> let's do it. Let's get some pork chops. Need a bit of pig. Need a bit of pig from the butchers, and I'll make you some lovely crackling. It'll be lovely. Excellent. The important thing is to make a red hook while you're making this because oh, yes. those are great. They've gone down very well. Join us on Patreon if you haven't already. Tell your friends about The Poisonous Cabinet and message us with any suggestions of extra merch you'd like before Christmas or any suggestions of stories you'd like us to cover in the coming weeks and months. And what should we do for Christmas time, my friends? Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.